TPS. The Dallas Cowboys and Green Bay Packers have always had great quarterbacks. The New York Yankees have always been carried by MVP hitters and Cy Young pitchers. The Boston Celtics have been guided by Hall of Fame big men for decades. Some teams have always excelled in one position. On the flip side, some clubs just can't ever seem to find a solution to a specific position no matter how hard they try. For positional graveyards, it's simple. We're looking at specific positions on a specific team where players always seem to fail. At TPS, we post videos every single day, so don't forget to click the subscribe button to subscribe. Then click the notification bell to be notified when we post a new video. But before we get started, here are a couple of dishonorable mentions. Los Angeles Lakers Big Men The Lakers only avoided our top 10 list because Shaquille O'Neal, Kyle Gasol, and Lamar Odom were supremely talented and productive big men in LA. After those three, however, the big man position graveyard began to open up in LA. Dwight Howard was never an MVP caliber player again once he joined the Lakers in 2012. Luol Deng, Brooke Lopez, Roy Hibbert, and Demarcus Cousins were also way past their best before dates when they joined the Lakers. At least they got Anthony Davis. He's too good to be part affected by the Lakers' big man graveyard. Green Bay Packers tight ends. As great as Aaron Rodgers is, the man simply can't get the most out of tight ends. Martellus Bennett got so fed up and was waived seven games into a three-year, $21 million contract. Two-time pro bowler Jarrett Cook, good for 50-plus catches and over 600 yards a year, only had 30 receptions for 377 yards and one touchdown in his lone 2016 campaign with the Packers. Five-time pro bowler Jimmy Graham signed a three-year, $30 million deal with the Pack in 2018. He only compiled 93 receptions for 1,083 yards and five touchdowns in his two seasons there before getting released. Now to the real list. Number 10, New York Jets defensive backs. The Jets built a great secondary that guided them to the AFC Championship game in 2009 and 10, so it's no surprise that ownership and the front office have thrown tens of millions around to try and rebuild it. Unfortunately, the Jets have been a graveyard for defensive backs in recent years. Remember when they brought back Darrell Rebus on a five-year, $70 million contract in 2015, two years after they traded him to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? The Jets got one good year out of Rebus before releasing him in 2017. The Jets also brought back old friend Antonio Cromartie in 2015 free agency, but the four-time Pro Bowler was well past his prime. He was gone after one year. Former standout safeties and brothers Dewan and Leron Landry made brief stops with the Jets near the end of their respective careers. And though, yeah, that $72.5 million contract with Trumaine Johnson certainly didn't pan out as hoped. These Jets really can't build a good secondary by a free agency to save their lives. Number 9. Toronto Maple Leafs Defenseman The NHL universe loves hating on the Maple Leafs. They're like the Dallas Cowboys media darlings. All hype, no action. But of course, their passionate fan bases will always tell you how it's their year. Well, that might actually be the case once they learn to stop destroying the careers of their defensemen. It's easy to forget that former New York Rangers franchise icon Brian Leach had a 15-game stint with Toronto in 2003-04. Remember former Calgary Flame star Dion Phaneuf, who put up 17-plus goals three times? Yeah, well, his career went downhill after he was traded to the Maple Leafs in 2010. That $49 million contract became a headache pretty quickly. Remember when they threw $14 million at Jeff Finger in 2008 when he only had 99 games of NHL experience? Yeah, he was gone after two years. And in 2009, they signed Montreal Canadiens all-star Mike Komisarek to a five-year $22.5 million deal. He was bought out after four uninspiring seasons, having played a total of 158 games over that span. The $15.5 million extension for John Michael Lyles in January 2012 also turned out to be a giant mistake. He was traded two years later. These Leafs have got to stop throwing money at defensemen for crying out loud, and NHL rear guard should stop signing with Toronto. You get a nice payday, sure, but is it worth joining their defensive graveyard? The great Arizona Cardinals running backs. You kids who didn't grow up watching the NFL's all-time rushing leader probably had no idea that he finished his career with the Arizona Cardinals. Yes, Emmitt Smith, a three-time Super Bowl champion and 1993 league MVP with the Dallas Cowboys, spent his final two years with the Cardinals. He totaled just 1,193 rushing yards and 11 TDs in the desert. And that was just the start. Three-time Pro Bowler and former 2,000-yard rusher Chris Johnson played his final three seasons in the desert. 
in 19 total games. CJ2K only had four touchdowns while averaging 3.8 yards per carry. Hardly spectacular. Four-time Pro Bowler and Hall of Famer Ed Jaron James had two productive seasons with Arizona, but he began to decline in 2008 after rushing for only 514 yards and three touchdowns. He played one more year in Seattle before retiring. And remember former Pittsburgh Steelers standout running back Rashard Mendenhall? His final season came in 2013 with the Redbirds on 687 yards with eight touchdowns while averaging just 3.2 yards per carry. That was it for his professional career. Number 7. Boston Red Sox Pitchers Pedro Martinez, Chris Sale, Rick Porcello, and John Lester all had success in Beantown, but plenty of high-profile pitchers saw their careers go downhill quickly upon joining the Red Sox. Dice K. Matsuzaka, a can't-miss superstar in the Japan Nippon Professional Baseball League, signed a $51.1 million deal with the Boston Red Sox in 2006. Though he won a World Series with them in his rookie year, Matsuzaka posted an unspectacular 4.52 ERA with a 50-37 and 37 record in six seasons for Boston. Not worth the money. Former LA Angels ace John Lackey signed an $82.5 million deal with the Boston Red Sox in 2009. Though he won a World Series with them in 2013, Lackey posted a mediocre 47-43 and 43 record and a lackluster 4.46 ERA in his four seasons there. Of course, he rebounded after joining the St. Louis Cardinals and Chicago Cubs, winning a World Series with the latter in 2016. Ensure David Price won a World Series with Boston in 2018, but he hated it there. You tell me if the drama headaches and list of injuries made Price a worthy $217 million investment, even if they won a World Series with him. And sadly, elbow woes quickly led to Chris declining in 2019 after he signed a $145 million extension. He underwent Tommy John surgery that put him out for the 2020 season and likely longer. Number 6. Philadelphia Flyers Goalies Roman Chekmanic had three great years in Philly from 2000-2001 to 2002-2003, but was run out of town after lackluster playoff performances. He was traded to the Los Angeles Kings in 2003 and was out of the NHL by 2004. Martin Byron was solid in Philly for two seasons from 2007-8 to 2008-9 but nothing close to what we saw from him during his time with the Sabres. Too bad the Flyers traded future Vesna Trophy winner Sergei Bobrovsky to the Columbus Blue Jackets in 2012. Instead, they threw a nine-year, $51 million deal at Ilya Brozgolov. He was bought out after just two seasons, posting a mere 905 save percentage and 2.60 goals against average. Former Blue Jackets starter Steve Mason and Detroit Red Wings number one goalie Peter Morazic also had frustrating stints in Philadelphia. The Flyers used five different goalies alone in 2019. Hopefully, current starter Carter Hart can avoid the Flyers' dreaded curse between the pipes. Number 5. Oakland Raiders Wide Receivers Yes, yes, Jerry Rice had three productive seasons in Oakland and helped them reach Super Bowl 37. But the Raiders also provided him with the graveyard that essentially ended his Hall of Fame career. Rice only had five catches for 67 yards and no touchdowns in six games for Oakland during the 2004 season. He sought a trade and was sent to the Seattle Seahawks, where he finished out his illustrious career. But oh, the second best receiver of all time also entered the Raiders' graveyard. Who can forget Randy Moss's forgettable two-year stint in Oakland? They almost ended his career. Thankfully, he got traded to the New England Patriots in the 2007 offseason. And all remember Javon Walker, former 1,000-yard guy for the Packers and Denver Broncos? Yeah, he finished his career in Oakland with 15 receptions, 196 yards, and one TD in 11 games over two seasons. And for good measure, Jordy Nelson, Aaron Rodgers' favorite receiver in Green Bay, entered the Raiders' graveyard in 2018 with 63 catches for 739 yards and three touchdowns. Hardly spectacular for a guy who hit 1,000 yards four times. And good thing Amari Cooper got traded to the Dallas Cowboys in 2018. Number 4 New York Rangers Forwards Stop us if you've heard this before. Big market team throws big dollars at big named players, with very few results. No NHL team has wasted more money on free agents than the New York Rangers over the past decade and a half or so. In 2002, they signed former hawking New Jersey Devil Center Bobby Holy to a five-year, $45 million contract. A consistent 20-goal and 50-60 to 60 point score, Holy only had 41 goals and 91 points in two seasons with the Blue Shirts before getting bought out. 
In 2007, the Rangers signed big-time scorers Chris Drury and Scott Gomez to deals worth $35.25 million, $51.5 million, respectively. Drury was coming off consecutive 30-goal and 60-point seasons in Buffalo. He only had 62 goals and 151 points in 264 games over four years with the Rangers. As for Gomez, he didn't quite live up to expectations and was traded to the Montreal Canadiens in 2009. Perhaps the biggest victim of the Rangers' graveyard for forwards? That would be former Tampa Bay Lightning and Dallas Stars superstar Brad Richards. He signed a nine-year, $60 million deal in 2011, a consistent 25-goal, 70-plus point guy in Tampa. Richards posted point totals of 66, 34, and 51 in the Big Apple before getting bought out in 2014. Number 3. LA Angels – Sluggers Sorry for not being overly specific, but be it an infielder or outfielder, the LA Angels really strike out when it comes to adding big-name sluggers. It all started when they signed former Cardinals legend Albert Pujols to a 10-year, $240 million contract for the 2012 season. A nine-time All-Star in St. Louis, Pujols has only been invited to one summer classic as a member of the Angels. Overall, his tenure in Cali has been extremely disappointing. Josh Hamilton's five-year, $125 million deal was a massive flop. He only spent two seasons with the Angels before going back to the Texas Rangers. And don't forget the $80 million contract the Angels handed to the 1995 AL MVP and former Red Sox slugger Mo Vaughn in 1998. He only lasted two seasons and was hampered by injuries, prompting the Angels to trade him to the New York Mets in 2001. Number 2. New York Knicks Everyone The Knicks have been the ultimate graveyard of basketball to the point where we refuse to do one position. We're including all of them. Man, where do we even start? Allen Houston, Eddie Curry, Jerome James, no, does Carmelo Anthony count? He did have some good years in New York, but his career also went downhill in the Big Apple. 2011 MVP Derrick Rose, defensive stalwart Joakim Noah, and former Phoenix Suns superstar Amari Stoudemire didn't fare too well in New York City either. 2006 overall pick Andrea Bargnani probably wishes he never landed there either. This isn't even a player's only graveyard. Hall of Famers Isaiah Thomas and Larry Brown flopped as head coaches in New York, so did the legendary Phil Jackson as the team's president. If this team didn't have so much history behind it, I'd argue it's just about time we delete James Dolan in the Knicks. And number one, the Cleveland Browns quarterbacks. We were so tempted to put the Knicks at number one, but really the Cleveland Browns quarterbacks are in a class of their own for positional graveyards. When you actually have a quarterback graveyard made for your team, you know it's bad. The Browns have used over 30 quarterbacks since they were reactivated in the 1999 season. Think about that. Their many draft busts include Tim Couch, Brady Quinn, Brandon Whedon, Johnny Manziel, Cody Kessler, and, well, Baker Mayfield is to be determined. Guys like Jeff Garcia, Trent Dilfer, Vinny Testaverde, Derek Anderson, and Jason Campbell couldn't do a whole lot in the land either. And it was much the same for journeyman Josh McCown, Tyron Taylor, Colt McCoy, and Brian Hoyer. It's just sad how many quarterbacks have played for the Browns in the past two decades. It's even more sad how many of them have seen their careers essentially end there. What other positional graveyards and sports should we have included on our list? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section down below. If you're new here and you haven't subscribed yet, now's a great time to do that. If you liked the video, then like the video. And last but not least, don't forget to tune in here at TPS for more cool videos every single day. We'll see you next time.